My name is Ann Sermons Gillis, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Theosophical Order of Service Legacy Project. And today I'm very happy to have with me the Director of the Public Programs for our National Theosophical Society. I want to welcome John Cianciosi. Welcome, John. Thank you, Ann. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so you're our resident Buddhist, I guess. <laughs> And your office is on the first floor. When you walk into the Wheaton office at the Theosophical Society, the first person you're going to see, if you don't look at the desk, you see his office is right in the back. And so what is it that you do? I mean, what happens in that office? What's your job? <laughs> what, I know you make a lot of stuff happen. I mean, you're everywhere. So what do you do? Uh, well, my title is Director of Public Programs. So basically, I schedule all the programs that are um, that we offer, that the Theosophical Society offers to the general public and it's to, to the members. And these uh, include a lot of online programs, especially since the pandemic. We really uh, exploded the number of online programs that we are offering. And they include classes and workshops and um, sometimes extended weekend uh, programs. And of course, the in-person programs, we, we've been fortunate to be able to restart those. Um, we have regular classes, we have events every week here. So my job is to find suitable presenters um, for a wide range of programs from all traditions. And of course, uh, making sure to include a good selection of core theosophical programs in that mix. Um, then I, I get all the information from these presenters. I work under the guidance of a program committee that reviews all my proposals for programs. And uh, they review and approve or disapprove of my proposals. Generally, it's quite a simple process. But it is in, uh, good to know that on that committee is the president, the national president of the Theosophical Society, and no program is ever um, offered to the public if the president does not approve of it. Uh, so even though it is a committee decision, the president always has uh, veto power uh, to ensure the quality and that it's in keeping with the mission of the Theosophical Society and correctly represents the work of the Theosophical Society. So my job is ongoing. Uh, we do offer a very large number of programs, as I've already said, and it's throughout the year. So I uh, am kept quite busy, um, and often I'm just chasing my tail, trying to catch up, and I never catch up because there's always the next month and the next month and the next month uh, to fill. Our programming has been... Um, I think very effective. Uh, it has reached an increasing number of people. And I do think that currently the national headquarters is truly a national headquarters with regards programming because before the pandemic and certainly before our increased online presence, most of our programs were for the people who are geographically in this area, in Illinois and around Chicago. Since we've increased our online presence, we are reaching a much bigger national audience and even international audience. And so, you know, I do feel that now we are really reaching out to our membership at large. Um, in addition to these ongoing programs, I coordinate, with the help of everybody else, Summer National Convention, Theosophist, any, these are the two big gatherings of the year that require extra, a little extra push, extra work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very rewarding position for me. I get to meet a lot of interesting people. I find it gratifying because I also get to hear teachings from a lot of interesting people. And it keeps me engaged with the spiritual work. 
Uh, so my work is actually part of my practice and my work is also my hobby. So, you know, it's a pretty good position. <laughs> wow. So let me understand this. Before the pandemic, you didn't have to put on nearly as many programs as you do now. That your job has, you have to do a lot more now than you used to because we're successful. <laughs> correct. That is quite correct. Before the pandemic, our online presence was quite small. Uh, it was, a, a, you know, pioneering stage. And Jim Bosco, some of your audience may uh, remember him. He was the one who first started to do uh, webinars uh, in a very small scale. And a lot of people were not very enthusiastic about doing things online, and it was more difficult. These uh, software and the platforms being used were not as friendly. Um, and, and But gradually we, we were evolving. Then when the pandemic hit, it was um, an earthquake. And, you know, we had to respond rather quickly, and we did. Uh, it was a difficult time, but it's all, you know, rather than doom and gloom, it turned out to be a, a very productive period for us because all of a sudden we, one, there was a, this new platform, Zoom, which is very user-friendly, easy to use. We had the staff, the Theosophical Society increased the staff for online programming. And we were able to put those up programs up rather quickly and in good quality and the public were also ready for it because most people were trapped at home and so like it or not they started to use online um, platforms such as zoom and internet became the medium and so the, the online uh, virtual programming took off and a lot of that and so then when we started to go back to in-person programming, it's, you know, we still want to maintain the same level of online, but now bring up the in-person. Uh, and that is quite challenging, actually. It's, it's difficult to do both at an equal level. Uh, and we're experimenting with it. It's, a, it's an ongoing experiment, I think. We've done very well, and, but times are always changing. And we have to respond accordingly. Yeah, I think after the pandemic, the word I use is like I'm consumed <laughs> because I had so many Zoom meetings. I'm going to switch my focus right now and ask you, where were you born? I am Italian. I was born in Italy um, in Abruzzo, which is a mountainous region, um, kind of central uh, towards the Adriatic Sea, but in the mountains there. Abruzzo is a very picturesque uh, province area. I would live there until I was 10, and my parents migrated to Australia. Um, and that's so I went to school in Australia. Ah, so that's where the accent comes from, Australia. It doesn't sound real Italian. <laughs> so no, I, I, nobody would. I've lived in so many different places. Uh, my accent is a bit of a mix. It is, it is a mix. Well, when you were growing up, I know that now you are a Buddhist. Is that the religion that you were raised in? No, no, no. I mean, I was. my parents were Catholic. I was supposedly a Catholic. I mean, I was uh, baptized, Holy Communion, uh, Confirmation. Uh, the whole lot. So I'm pretty good. I'm safe on that side. Uh, but when I was, you know, my parents were not very diligent with religion. I mean, we went to church occasionally, very rarely. Most of the time, my parents were farmers. We were very poor and you just work. When we migrated to Australia, my father worked three jobs. My mother worked. Um, I just went to the, the, the closest school, which was just a state school, um, a very poor area. And, you know, the, the, these uh, religion wasn't such a big deal. Uh, it was just taken for granted that 
you know, obviously you're Catholic, you're Italian. <laughs> so, but I never found it very, I just don't believe things very easily. And I didn't relate to the idea of having to believe. Uh, and when I did finally try to understand what Catholicism was, it was when I my mother insisted on me being confirmed at the age of I think I was 16 or 17 and to before you're confirmed in the Catholic Church you have to do this kind of catechism study period and I remember doing it and, and I told the priest you know well, uh, well what do you do when if you don't really believe this and he said well you've got to believe <laughs> and I could not relate to that at all so I, I would say I, I was agnostic at that stage, at the very least, if not an atheist. Um, but I was very interested. I, I, you know, like most young people, we want to understand. We want to have meaning. We want to know what we don't know. And uh, I was a chemist. I studied chemistry, which is like a, an inquiry into life. And I had a lot of Asian friends and... Uh, when I finished my studies and worked for a little, just one year to save money, I wanted to travel. And I traveled to Southeast Asia um, on a grand journey to Europe, which I never got to. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, while in Thailand, I came across Buddhism. And it was just uh, the right thing at the right time. It appealed to me. It seemed to offer uh, an opportunity to arrive at deep understandings about oneself, about reality. It offered a path that didn't seem to require faith, but rather try it and see what happens. And meditation was very appealing. I was not interested in the uh, religious trappings, externals, but I was very interested in the teachings and in meditation. And that's... Uh, one thing led to another and I became a novice and then a monk and then ended up staying in Thailand for 10 years rather than years. what I had originally expected. And what part of Thailand were you in? Well, I traveled throughout Thailand. Um, the, my teacher, whom I eventually went to stay with, was in northeast Thailand, which is quite a, um, a poor part of Thailand. And he was a forest dweller, a forest monk. And so I lived in a forest, mainly forest monasteries in Northeast Thailand. But I, I also spent time in Northern and Southern Thailand as well as Central. So pretty extensive uh, periods everywhere. So could you give us a little bit more detail? What is a forest monastery? I mean, is it a building in the forest or, <laughs> or more than that? Well, I, I mean, the, the the very traditional, I mean, it goes back to the time of the Buddha, because the Buddha was a samana, one seeking to make oneself peaceful. Uh, before he became a Buddha, he was a mendicant seeker. And these samanas were lived outside of the communities. Most of them lived in forests or jungles or mountains or caves but most of them would rely on alms food. So they would walk to the villages and towns to collect alms in the morning. And so the Buddha, when he, he established his monastic uh, community, the monks who were training, uh, he encouraged them to live in forests, to, to live in secluded places away from the crowds and the noise and the distractions of community uh, lay life yeah. however they could not become um hermits because the way the buddha set up the monastic order was that the monks would be dependent on the lay community for food in particular but also for clothing and sh shelter and medicines so monks cannot cook for themselves, they can't grow food, they can't, Buddhist monks, um, they can't keep food overnight. So basically the idea is that you would be removed from the lay people, but each day you would have to go if you wanted to eat, go to the village. And this has set up this perfect um, 
if you wish, mutual support. Lay people would be inspired by the occasional coming into their lives of these spiritual seekers. They'd be reminded of the spiritual life. Monks would be supported materially by the lay community. Uh, and this worked very well. And uh, in Thailand, most of the monks live in cities and city temples, but the more there are still forest monks, forest dwellers. The, the, these monasteries are usually start off very small. It's usually in a jungle place, a, a forested area uh, where monks go and just stay there, just live there. And gradually, if the community grows and the they they build buildings. Uh, they will have a, a meeting hall. They will have uh, individual huts uh, for monks to live in. Each monk has a little hut, just a you know can be made and usually made out of wood. It can be made out of anything. Um, so there's a central place for gathering, for meetings, uh, for meditation, chanting. There are individual huts throughout the forest for monks to go to and stay by themselves. Uh, and, you know, most forest monasteries then have a community schedule. Uh, so they are removed from the villages. It's, some of them are more remote than others. Some of them are really jungles in the jungle. Some of them are just uh, maybe a 20 or 30 or 40, 50, 100 acre forest that's been protected and around it are paddy fields and other things. Wow. So is that what your lifestyle was, that you would have to go into the village each day and ask for food? Yes. we The forest monastery where my teacher's forest monastery, where I trained and lived and the other ones, um, the schedule is very, you know, it's very austere life very strict, very disciplined. Um, but one of the things is to be dependent on arms and every monk goes on arms round. And that, you know, you have robes and bowl. That's what you get when you ordain. And you walk silently through the village or the town. You're not allowed to ask for anything. Uh, you can stand in silence. You accept what is given to you unless it's one of the forbidden items, such as money is a forbidden item. Um, raw meat is a forbidden item. Some raw foods are forbidden items. Other than that, you just eat what the villagers give you or what the town people give you, um, which is what they eat. And you accept it silently and when you've got enough, you go back to your monastery. <laughs> but usually if you live in a monastery, if you're by yourself, you a lot of time you may be living by yourself. So you, when you have enough in your bowl, you go back to your hut and eat there. If you live in a monastery, usually there is a community dining hall or eating hall. The food is redistributed amongst equally amongst all the monks and you eat. We used to eat once a day once in the morning after arms round and that so it makes life very very simple you go on arms round you come back you eat and then you put everything away and the, the day is done well if i remember correctly uh you're are you married i am married yes so how did you get from there to here be married that, that's a very different lifestyle how did that oh, just yeah. occur uh, well, I lived in Thailand for 10 years as a monk, and I was the abbot of a branch monastery where I was training other Western monks who were coming to study under my teacher. And he was invited to send monks to Australia, to Perth, Western Australia, to establish a forest monastery in Perth. And so he... he gave his blessings. I, being one of the Australian monks, I guess, uh, I was one who was asked to go with, together with another Australian monk. That was in 1982. And we went to Perth with the mission of teaching and helping this 
a very small Buddhist community um, of both Australians and Asians who had formed the, the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and to possibly start a monastery. And so that was in 1982. We did that. The monastery grew, developed the big monastery in Perth, which is still there. I lived in Perth and, until 1995, um, so quite a long time. But towards the end of my stay there, um, I was struggling with uh, the responsibilities and my role in particular. Uh, you know, sometimes we are so successful that we we come to a point where we're not actually up to the task which is what I felt like at that time. And there were many conditions, many reasons, but I really, uh, I took a year sabbatical, went on retreat in Burma and Sri Lanka. And after that, I really felt that I did not have the energy, the enthusiasm um, to remain abbot, and I resigned. And after I resigned that, I just decided that I really didn't have the enthusiasm for the monastic life anymore. I or the energy, the, the, the aspiration, I guess, fizzled. Um, and I really felt like I wanted to step back. And so in 1995, I uh, disrobed, which is allowed in the Buddhist tradition. It's very easy to disrobe uh, normally. It's easier to disrobe than to become a monk. But if one has been a monk for a long time, it's a, di a very difficult emotional thing to do because it affects not only oneself, but it's all the people who have had faith and confidence in you and have supported you for many, many years. So that was a quite a traumatic um, time for me. But the decision was very clear in my mind that I wanted to step down. And, and so I disrobed and left the monastic life. And shortly after, I came to Chicago and started a new life. Well, what brought you to Chicago? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I, had, uh, I had known a woman here who had been a disciple for quite some time. Uh, so it was a romantic, uh, I, I guess you can say, interest. Uh, but I had the invitation to come and to stay here. And, you know, I didn't have uh, too many other options <laughs> at that time. So I did come um, and stayed with her. And we eventually did marry. And that marriage did last for about 10 years. And we're still on good terms, but we did separate and divorce. And I came to the Buddhists, the national headquarters here, because when I came to Chicago, uh, she lived in a, an apartment which was not too far from Wheaton, uh, very close, only about 10 miles. And I knew of the Theosophical Society because I'd had some contact with the Theosophical Society in Perth. Um, and I knew the president quite well there. And people from the Theosophical Society in Perth would come to the Buddhist Center. The Buddhist Center, would, we would hold retreats at the Theosophical Society Retreat Center. So we had very good relations. And also the Theosophical Society here, the, uh, the Quest Publishing House, the Theosophical Publishing House, had printed the book of um, my teacher. It was a, an early book put together by Jack Cornfield and um, Paul Brighter. A Still Forest Pool was published by Quest. And so I knew of the, this uh, publishing house as well. And I came here uh you know shortly after arriving in chicago and i came i started to give some talks and teachings here occasionally and so i became became somewhat involved with the theosophical society here and then how did you happen to get the job that you have now <laughs> it's the first, well, it's the first job you got 
with them. So, um, it wasn't. I had when I I first saw. I mean, I had other jobs before. I was teaching at a community college part time, and I'd had a job in maintenance uh, with another organization. And in twenty, I think it was twenty twenty five, uh, twenty oh five, twenty uh, two thousand and five. Um, the theater here, the Ocot was advertising for a maintenance assistant. And I was in transition. That was after separation from my wife. And I was going to go back to Australia. But in the meantime, I had to get things in order. And so they knew me here. Um, I came, I was, I thought I'd have a year in which to settle all my affairs and so i asked about the job and betty blank was very keen to have me work here and live here so i got a job in the maintenance department and worked in that department for quite a, many years actually i very much enjoy that type of work um but gradually there was an opportunity to be more involved in uh the programs programming and so I started to move into that and eventually just ended up doing all my time in programming and no time in maintenance, although for a good number of years I was doing both. So what year was this that you first came to the Theosophical Society um, in, in Wheaton? To work? Uh, yeah, well, just that you started coming and then you went. I started to... probably in 1987, 86, 87. I would have come here to to visit and started to do some teaching here, lectures, maybe 86. John Alger was still here. And then uh, with Betty Bland and, and David Bland, uh, I started working full time here. Well, that, that's pretty amazing. So what we're talking about, uh, Theosophical Society and Theosophy in general has had a very close relationship with Buddhism. I'm wondering in your experience there being right on campus and being surrounded by many of Blavatsky and so many other wonderful teachers, um, if you have found that to be true or has there been any, well, this doesn't seem to fit with this or does it seem to all just work out in your world? Um, you know, even you'll find that even within the Buddhist tradition, of course, there's quite a variety. Um, so my, I tend to prefer simplicity over complexity. I tend to prefer practical, practicality over, um, elaborate explanations. Um, so that's why I was much more drawn to Theravada Buddhism than, say, Tibetan Buddhism. And actually, I was all very well, very much drawn to Zen Buddhism as well because of that clarity and simplicity and strong emphasis on practice. And in, unfortunately, Theravada Buddhism, it, it, you know, there is, again, such a variety. Most of Theravada Buddhism is pretty uh, superficial. Uh, but there, there are those sincere... Um, dedicated practitioners practice monks such as the forest monks and, and many others uh, so my interest was always on a, something that has to be practical and i don't want a, an enormous explanation philosophical uh psychological analysis of it, everything um I, you know i'm not that interested uh so the clarity of Theravada Buddhism from the, uh, in particular, from the discourses of the Buddha, as it was represented um, and, you know, personified by my teacher, was very appealing to me. Uh, and so that is remains true. Now, with regards, um, the if we want to say, is, does everything match up? exactly what's in the theosophical teachings yeah, there are some differences you know the, you know is it really of any great significance 
I I don't think so. Not if you want to practice, <laughs> if you want to debate and argue about things. Sure, there may be some points of differences, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, and with regards theosophy, again, I, I want you know, like I think that is one of the one of the pitfalls of any body of teachings is that it becomes too um, too theoretical. You know, it doesn't mean anything very it doesn't mean a lot that you know all this stuff <laughs> and that you have an explanation yes in the end you know what are you doing with it it's no good that you know all that stuff and so i find the you know very um a lot of the secret doctrine teachings that i'm not well versed in um and a lot of the the same with the Tibetan uh, teachings of that are too are just too elaborate for me. You know, the teachings of the Buddha were very pragmatic, very practical, and we don't have to explain everything. What we need to do is to know the path of practice uh, in order to free the mind. Um, and that's the emphasis of Buddhism. Um, I don't think there are, you know, I don't think there are contradictions. I think there are just differences. Like, for instance, you know, Buddhists believe that rebirth happens. One, the moment of death is followed by the moment of rebirth. There, there, you know, there is no intermediate, <laughs> because intermediate just means a, a, if there is existence, it's existence. And so that's that's there is existence. So that's for rebirth. That's a birth. There's no existence without birth. Um, so the moment of death is is, is the followed by the moment of rebirth. Where is the where is the rebirth? It can be according to the karma at the moment of death. It, it, it from the Buddhist perspective, it, it can be on a higher or lower state of existence. From the theosophical position, you've got this whole system of, you know, you pass away, then you go to De Devachan. It's not called a reincarnation or a rebirth, but you're no longer, <laughs> you're now in Devachan. And that you're in Devachan for thousands of years before you're reincarnated. I, I don't know. I mean, I they, they seem to be saying somewhat different things, but it doesn't matter uh i don't think it matters personally i think it's more important to think of how we're living in order that we can create the conditions for a good rebirth and possibly no need for rebirth that's another area of you know once again what does it mean what is the goal theravada buddhism in particular tends to put a lot of emphasis on enlightenment and liberation that the the buddha stressed that one strives in order to purify the mind from greed hatred and delusion to arrive at a deep uh, penetrating understanding uh insight into a reality knowledge and vision of things as they are which has the power to dispel attachment delusion and aversion and that that is liberation and one who's liberated is not reborn um, because one is liberated from the realm of birth and death so that that is different the emphasis in Mahayana tradition as well as I think in uh, theosophy is very much this idea of um, you know sometimes I, again I think it's just misunderstanding there is this notion that if you strive for enlightenment for yourself that's not really the highest thing it's much better not to be enlightened so you can help other people uh you know that's to me it's contradictory personally because if the buddha believed that he wouldn't have become enlightened um so i, I you know it doesn't make sense but the ideals, the Bodhisattva ideals are incredibly inspiring, beautiful. 
Uh, and you know, we all want to be that. But uh, I think there is a misunderstanding about what it means. <laughs> and uh, there's little things like that may be different. It doesn't matter. That is very powerful what you just said. And I, I ha happen to believe everything you've just said. Those, those are my feelings as well. Uh, there seems sometimes there's just too much information than um, not enough transformation here and now, present moment stuff. Yet, I, I will say that within the Theosophical Society, and we have so many branches and so many teachers and so many uh, different places that we have our organization, that there seems to be a place and space for every belief. There's the central teaching, but when we are called to explore uh, philosophy and science and consciousness and the arts, that gives us a very wide playing field. And it seems like it probably is not so important to try to reconcile differences because as you said, it really doesn't matter. Those are just, they are theories. They're not absolute truths. They're what we believe. So exactly. in, in your um, your spiritual quest, your journey, or maybe non-journey, if, if you really are about being really present and simple, are there any particular teachers other than your master that have been helpful to you maybe through a book or or through personal experience um and they may not even be buddhist but just somebody that's or someone or other or more than one that have impacted your life uh yes i i mean there have been many many teachers in in addition to my my main teacher i mean his first western disciple was like a big brother to me i've always found him extreme, incredibly uh inspiring he's still alive he's 90 years old now uh, he's quite wow. aged um and, and many of the other teachers in thailand in burma in sri lanka within the buddhist tradition whom i felt a great sense of uh respect for but and as far out, outside of Buddhism, I've read you know many inspiring things from other traditions that uh, have uplifted me. But not only that, uh, you know, to be quite honest, um, you know, even people whom we don't think of as spirit necessarily spiritual leaders, you know, I, I it just I, this morning I was giving a talk and I was reflecting on like leaders. And Nelson Mandela, I found he, you know, extraordinarily inspiring. <laughs> Just this person, how his values, how he lived, this is really inspiring. Mahatma Gandhi, I read a book about Winston Churchill, who's a bit of an eccentric man, but, you know, what he was able to do. It was an incredible feat, you know, really the strength of character, the just the, the ability to to persist in the face of so much, uh, you know, difficulty to lead a nation. And, you know, I, I don't want to name political figures so much because often they're clouded, but, you know, all of us have some figures that to us represent an ideal you know a personification of an ideal of human potential that we really would like to <laughs> emulate in some way or at least we feel it in ourselves yeah this is really good this is what a human being can be um so I, you know i get that sense from a variety of people um and you know it's not that it, it, these people are necessarily perfect but what they represent is you see in them uh, a quality that somehow is uplifting and inspiring, makes you look up to what a potential is. Because, you know, we, it, it's sometimes we know, the thing is we know ourselves better than we know anybody else. And so when we know ourselves this well, we know our flaws <laughs> pretty well. And sometimes it's, it's good to see the nobility that is possible that we can rise up to. And so, yeah, there's been many people 
sometimes even people I encounter just in the street. You know, I, I've said this a number of times and I don't want to, it's not like, you know, I talk about my wife, uh, my current, my present wife. Uh, in that she is the most generous, kind-hearted person I can imagine. I, I don't know why she's like that, but she is. And, you know, that doesn't mean she has no faults or that she's perfect. But those qualities, I mean, most of us are trying to develop those qualities. Uh, she's just extraordinarily generous and kind-hearted. Um well, you know, she may have other faults, but those qualities would be you know, inspire me. And so I find inspiration from various places, from imperfect people. Um, you know, the Buddha said that one of the greatest blessings is to have good friends. I personally feel that I've had many, 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 many wonderful friends, wonderful people. Uh, that have helped me by, you know, helping me ri rise up. By th they feel they they shown me things that make me feel I can do better. So that's been probably a great source of comfort for me and a great source, uh, you know, a great blessing that I've been blessed to have lots and lots of good friends to this day. I mean, I don't have a lot of friends, but as people whom I associate, just I associate, like here I get to work at the Theosophical Society. Is it perfect? Do people never complain? Do I never complain? Of course not. But when I stop and think, you know, I've, I'm working with virtuous people. I'm working with people with high ideals. I never have to think that somebody's going to stab me in the back, that they're going to take advantage of me you know it's really a blessing that's beautiful i can i can feel that when you speak that and i'm going to just segue into if you could tell me briefly what is your philosophy of life oh dear <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't have said briefly huh <laughs> no 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 i i think our philosophy reflects where we are at that at that particular time in life you know it is a moving target in some ways in that we evolve and change um for a long time you know i do think that i had much more um just a, a much more drive to reach higher uh, currently uh, you know, and this was a choice I made, was to live more comfortably and to live more contentedly. So my philosophy of life is to appreciate where we are, to see with gratitude what we have. And if we meditate, to meditate, to be peaceful, not to become peaceful, and to live in a way which is fulfilling by being contented, not by expecting to become fulfilled. So, you know, I tell people I'm more contented now than I've been in my life before, um, not because I've achieved anything fantastic. It's just that quality of contentment at ease, uh, not too ambitious, you know, not too uh, dissatisfied, you know, not to be, sometimes we make ourselves unhappy just because we don't want to be happy. So, uh, you know, just to appreciate, appreciate what, all the good things that we, most of us are, actually do have. Isn't it amazing that America is the wealthiest country and most of us who are fortunate enough to live in you know what i call middle class america in places that are safe surrounded by uh, suburbia suburbia is actually quite nice you're safe you can walk down the street you have gardens you have parks you have electricity running hot water food 
Um, that is actually very comfortable. And people are so unhappy <laughs> and people are so discontented because they always want something else. So my philosophy in life is to, you know, just to stop and, and reflect on what we do have. And if we can appreciate what we have, we will have more contentment. And with contentment will also come gratitude and happiness. Thank you. I remember the story about some Africans that were watching a cruise ship come up and the Westerners get off the cruise ship and the Africans are talking among themselves. And they're looking at these people because to them, that's quite a privilege to be able to be on a cruise ship. And they look at each other and they say, why are they so miserable? <laughs> because the people, they don't look happy, you know, they're complaining and every everything. And so uh, you speak great wisdom. I, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. I wonder if there is any. Uh, well, I do uh, come to think that I wonder, have you had any contact with the Theosophical Order of Service? Uh, yes, of course. They, they are regulars here uh, at the Theosophical Society and, and they, they meet here. I've joined in some of their occasional, occasionally joined in some of their activities of service um, with the humanitarian uh, group um, and, and a few things. Like, and I know a lot of the people who are very active in it. Um, so I am familiar with it. And I think, again, service is a wonderful way to express one's spirituality. Yes, thank you. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, is there anything that I didn't cover that you might like to say in closing or, or you have you said it all? <laughs> I think I've said as much as I can say at present. You said everything you needed to say. Well, again, I want to thank you so much, Sean, for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure.